Hmm? No. no? Yes. Unfortunately, there are successful problems. I'm sure you're all well aware, and as Paul has reiterated this morning, many of you will know much more about particular species that I'm going to mention this morning. Um, obviously, we've touched on the Anthropocene era this morning. Our impacts, I, I, humans, are having this significant impact on the Earth's ecosystems and species extinctions. Um, we are undoubtedly the greatest force in spreading an invasive non-native species, aiding dispersal, fragmenting major biomes, altering eco ecosystem dynamics. And it's perhaps in creating these new niche niches and biomes that's the, the biggest challenge for us. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Lindis Farm in the picture here, Piri Piri Burr. You're probably well aware of the impacts here. This is actually my jacket, and this is a plant that we have in the garden. So there is a, a very serious issue there. So the greenhouse gases, obviously biochemistry, CO2, anybody that's got a garden, and Paul didn't quite give me my P45 earlier, but near enough. Um, but if any of you have got a garden and are aware of just the, the, the recent weather that we've had, you know, grasses have been growing incredibly quickly, and any garden plants have. Uh, disturbing nutrient pure habitats, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Management regimes, what we're doing, impact of pesticide and fertilizer use. And globally, the, the impact of fire, you know, we've probably seen many of the pictures, it's perhaps the only weather phenomena that we've not experienced in the recent past is, you know, we've had storm force winds, we've had intense rainfall, we've had intense cold, but uh, long drought as they've had perhaps in California and some parts of uh, Southeast Asia, it's something that we've not had, but who knows. Um, changing fauna, Paul's touching that, and I will not go to that, it's not my area of expertise, predators and potential dispersers. And obviously the Piri Piri bird came into North East England on sheep's wool, it was imported from New Zealand. So aiding the dispersal, I'm not sure if you can see this at the back, uh, but this is really what we've trashed, the, the, the brown. And then if you overlay that uh, with a species diversity chart, where you can see the red, or the hotspots, the biodiversity hotspots, the, the figures are roughly 5,000 uh, species, the sort of sign of Himalaya here, 5,000 species per 10,000 kilometre squared. And then if you overlay them together, you can see, and it echoes pretty much what Paul was just saying, that where there are ecologically niche, ecological niches, these invasive non-native plants do very successfully move in. And that's something I'm sure many in the audience have to deal with on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and for some of us for a long number of years. But why is this? I think, obviously, there are three key elements Paul thinks touched on two. I'm going to touch on perhaps a, a third one that I'm perhaps more aware of. Um, this is the social change, the social impacts. You know, it's, it's, we, Paul gave the example of the Japanese knotweed in, introduced in 1825. There was a lag time 1888 uh, before it suddenly became an issue. But why it became an issue was, I think, because of the impacts of the First and Second World War. There was significant change in the country in terms of uh, social uh, demographics, the number of individuals that were killed, unfortunately, in the, in the Great War. You know, staff numbers in big estates where many of these plants were first introduced, uh, reduced, plants got out of hand, and they never really, really regained. The other thing that, obviously, I'm more familiar with is uh, the global plant trade. You know, Paul's touched on the significance of that. And I do think, I'll come, particularly with the plants, but there are, unfortunately, other newer uh, associate problems I'll touch on right at the very end. Um, and then climate change, you know, if, if we've, whether it's subtle or not so subtle, but the, the impacts, you know, we're all uh, seeing these on a, a first-hand basis. And the impacts and the costs, um, I think that's something that we're, we're all well aware of. Um, but from a plant's perspective, you know, in, in the UK, um, you know, the average temperature increase, you know, with, with the number of, it seems to be every year is warmer than the previous year. Average rainfall is increasing, although we're getting longer drier spells in between. And the dates, in, or in terms of the growing, or the length of the growing season, both the date of the first frost and the autumn is becoming later and later, and the last frost in the spring is becoming later and later as well. So these growing dates. So what are the impacts of these on plants? And I think that's perhaps why some of these plants are becoming so important, uh, so efficient and effective. So they are undoubtedly successful problems. The unfortunate thing is we're not alone. You know, this is a global list of uh, worst offenders. Any of you have followed overseas, you've probably seen this uh, ginger, the Sedicium gardnerianum. You know, that's perhaps one of the most successful invasive non-native 
plants, and you can the, the ones in, uh, or I don't know if you can see at the back, but the ones in sort of orange, or red, sorry, are problems that we've got currently. The, orange, the ones in orange are things that might become an issue, if, for instance, around the Donax, it's uh, very similar to Miscanthus used in biomass production. Um, some of the other ones, hopefully, unless we get these significantly improvements, or significant improvements in our temperature, I don't think any of these other ones. This uh, Japanese grass might be an issue, but not for a long time. You know, cases, or puntias, well, you know, dry, hot, sunny weather, Mediterranean climate, that, if we get significant climate change. And then you can see some of the, the other species there. So there is a long list of plants that are causing a problem, not just uh, in, in the UK, but in Scotland, but further afield as well. So with, there are the same issues that are being confronted by organisations. So I think Paul touched on that in his talk. I think we do need to learn more from our overseas colleagues. You know, they've been dealing with similar problems with similar uh, habitats and similar ecosystems, so we, we can learn more from them. So the Aponte I've mentioned, the Pueria, this is probably, I think, in the, the top five as well. I'll not steal Stan's thunder and talk too much about the UK strategy, um, but this is obviously, and I think I think the comment that we've, we've heard already is that, you know, we, the, the, it's, I think out of every crisis there's normally something good that happens and I think there are probably a number of organisations and individuals working more closely together and obviously a forum like today is a fantastic venue to get um, and exchange ideas um, and I think working together in collaboration and partnership, and I'll come back to that, has to be one of the, the benefits of working with invasive non-native species. In terms of these niches, um, obviously the urban, urban biome, um, it's relatively poor, uh, species poor at present, but these pre-adapted species you're probably all well familiar with, uh, Ludley and David I, you know, that is perhaps one of the most successful, you know, a Chinese plant introduced, what, 1857, um, its name commemorates a French missionary, I'm not so sure uh, whether we'd be happy about being commemorated in that respect now, but it is perhaps the single most successful plant on railway lines you know, butterfly bushes, you know, there is this, um, you know, from it in terms of uh, you know, pollinators or whatever, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, and I'm not going to get into that debate this morning, but suffice to say, it is a very successful plant of filling these niches along railway tracks, and uh, obviously I'm not sure if there's anybody from, uh, what's the organisation, Network Rail, that I don't know how much they spend a year on trying to control Budley and David I along their tracks, but, and it is subtle changes in temperature and niches that do allow these plants to continually adapt and survive. Fireweed, um, obviously I'm sure a colleague of mine remarked that if, the, if it wasn't a non-native plant and from a horticultural perspective, if it wasn't introduced, you'd probably want to introduce it because it is such an attractive plant until you see the, the seeds starting to flow away in their tens of thousands. But it does spread very rapidly. Um, you've probably seen it uh, railway lines, roadsides, but I think the question from a, from a biological perspective is, that, is it an escape from these forest clearings or is that a new ecotype eco from Canada? And again, it echoes the, the conversation to do with uh, Japanese knotweed. Um, you know, it's small changes in the <coughs> DNA of a plant that does make it even more successful than normal. The bud layer, oh yes, we've mentioned that. So that's Western China. But again, that lag time. Um, and I think probably the First and Second World War, particularly the Second World War and the, the bombing of, the unfortunate bombing of London, but it just took over many of the, the brownfield sites then. And then it, since then, it's more or less spread right up and down the length and breadth of the country. But in terms of the, the costs, and I think this is, again, there's probably many of you in the, and I see there's something in the back about giant hogweed, there, there will be many of you in the audience that are dealing with this on a day-to-day basis, particularly at this time of year, but the estimated cost, you know, the, the figures are <coughs> eye-wateringly large, 1.7 billion, Scotland 251 million, you know, and, and plants, unfortunately, is the single biggest cost, and many of you devote much of your time and effort to control them. Social change have touched on, climate change, and the global trade in plants. You know, we do, you know, the, many of our plants, and I think some of the the most spectacular own goals in terms of plant disease in recent years have come, well, probably through greed and avarice. I think ash dieback, you could have been much, much smarter in reducing the, the impacts on the wider uh, 
wider natural environment um, by just being a bit smarter about how we manage and grow our plants. Um, and obviously the charts that Paul showed in terms of that exponential increase in cost until it becomes almost impossible to control. So the early intervention and horizon scanning I'm going to come back to and the public awareness, I think the, the comments that Paul made about uh, not demonising plants. But I'm going to embarrass Stan now from SNH. He's probably not, I don't know how many of you read the, the Dundee Courier, what I call the Dundee Courier, but here we can see hogweed ideal. It's perhaps the only time that invasive non-native plants make the, the local paper uh, or make the press at all. And again, it's for the very reason. But there is a very factual, you probably can't read it, I can't read it either, but there's a very factual account of what the, the control measures and the requirement is. And I think this case, I'm not sure if it was actually in Dundee or not, but that is perhaps the only time that uh, invasive <coughs> non-native species make the, the press when there is a problem to humans. But I think we need to be smarter in how we manage our news stories when it comes to invasive non-native species. Um, obviously the, the invasive non-native species week initiative in April is an excellent opportunity to raise profile and how we do that. And I think we are wearing multiple hats, both the botanic garden and representing us all wider horticultural community, I think we can get smarter about raising the profile, whether it's through with aquatic plants or other species that are likely to cause problems in key uh, habitats other than aquatics. So something to do for the future, or something to consider in the future, and I'm sure there'll be plenty, many people out here with much better press and marketing expertise. Giant hogweed, I think I gave you that, the correct date there, Paul, was it 1888? But yes, like the, the bugley is, it had this long lag time, and then I think where it became more of an issue in recent years is when it's now, uh, I haven't bought a house for a long time, but correct me, I've got the right term, is it the home report, where they need to identify whether there's a giant hogweed, Japanese not weed on there. And I know there might be some play in my names, the number of inquiries I get about Japanese not weed in the garden because my name's not and there's no relation whatsoever. <laughs> and I don't make any money off it either. Mm -hmm. So, the, the single cost, but the single female clone, and I think to put it in, in how we, we news manage stories, one of the best stories that we had uh, within the garden was one of my colleagues, Michelle Hollingsworth, she did a piece uh, identifying the single clone and the amount of press coverage that she got and it's how we get these hooks in terms of, you know, making people aware that there is a, although we're, we're, we're doing hard science if you like, we do need to get that message across a wider audience. We, we all know what we're doing and why we're doing it, but do the, our, our, our well, fund masters or funders or stakeholders and do our priorities with the Scottish Government know, know about that as well. I'm not terribly sure that they do. And then obviously more recently, Cabby have been doing a lot of work on the the biocontrol, but whether that's long-term success or not, I'm not sure. So no talk on uh, invasive non-native species would be complete, I don't think. This is my first experience of uh, rhododendron ponticum, ponty bashing, many happy years on the, the west coast in the winter months, dripping rain, soaked through the skin, clearing ponticum. <laughs> not quite the, what is it, there is a, a group I've seen now that do it by someone like Tai Chi, you know, natural, I don't know how successful that is, but all I can say is it's, it's back-breaking work and it's not very nice. Uh, but the scale of it, again, this is the current figure. I think that, I'm not sure if that's the right figure, if that's wrong, I do apologise. 150,000 football pitches covered in, you know, or equal two-thirds of Greater London. When, although my son stays in London, I don't think uh, he'd be too unhappy to see Rodan in a product in London, but I don't know. Um, so, whether that figure's right or not, and that, going back to the press, my, my biggest bugbear about Rodin and Pornicum, and I know we've got a problem, when you start seeing that on calendars at Christmas, this is portraying the Scottish scene when you've got Rodin and Pornicum on the calendars. So we, we, we have a problem. If we can't have a calendar without an invasive, invasive non-native species, there is a problem. So you'll look more closely at calendars in the shops this year, won't you? So, cutting and burning, anybody that's done it, you'll know it's always in the steepest, most inhospitable sites. Nice, horrible, acrid smoke. And the, the worst thing about rhododendron and pornicum leaves is they're full of cyanide as well. So, I'm not sure how many claims we're likely to get in the future from staff members like myself for cutting and burning pornicum. This is over at Benmore. So, 
we, we can see, we as an organisation are seeing the problem from both sides. You know, we've, we've part like, we've poached them, gate gave it a like, we've probably planted the plants that are now a, now a problem. Um, chemical control is definitely required. You can cut the stumps back, anybody that's controlled the uh, product will, will know that you can cut it back and then you get this almost like perfect seed bed the following year. You get the regrowth. Unfortunately, some of the, the best chemicals, I think, are the chemicals that I used when I was younger, are no longer available. Um, so Roundup, uh, I'm not advocating or uh, representing Monsanto, but uh, that seems to be the, the chemical of choice. And there's various additives that you can use to give you greater efficiency. And if you've spent a couple of years clearing an area, the last thing you want to be doing is going back the following year and clearing it again. And I think that's the, the, the story with many of the invasive non-native species. Once you've started, you really, really do have to keep going. And it can be a bit soul destroying, but you have to do it. You have to be very firm and rigorous. And I'm sure there'll be many managers in the audience with that echo that sentiment and that endorsement. So replanting, again, a nice steep slope as well. And then perhaps from a wider natural environment is the impact on the Atlantic Ocean. You know, the, we, we know how significant it is, you know, we've heard Paul say about this, but I think when you've got, that's maybe not a terribly great picture, when you see the hillside, I don't know if you can see these, these are a bit like the, uh, what do they call the trees in the, the Lord of the Rings? Heads. Heads, a bit like heads, because they've had this massive understory of Pontagon, it looks a really, really bizarre. They do not look like oaks, but the, the good thing about oaks is they do have this propensity to regenerate. You've got the clearance, and then hopefully, after maybe five, seven, eight years, you've got this. My other experience of uh, invasive non-native species clearance is Rubus spectabilis. Now, this is quite a bizarre plant. You know, introduces game cover, 1820s by David Douglas, taken over. It seems to be only a problem in certain parts of the, the country, like Northern Ireland, for instance, is, has a horrendous problem. I'm not sure if anybody's seen it in Northern Ireland. Um, the fruit's quite beautiful. It's a bit sour, but you do, you know, it's edible. And you can see why birds are spread. So we, I spent maybe 20 years trying to control this in the borders. Picture, this was the big storm. Many of you in the audience will be far too young to remember, 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, tree cover removed, Rubus took over, strimmed it all, removed it. You can see here, uh, and then this is a, almost quite a before and after with a, a cracked glass slide. So that will show you how old that picture is. So yes. A labour of love, you know, 20 years in the in the making, but it's it's worth it in the end. But then the secret is keeping on top of it again, and I think that's one of the you know from today you'll probably all have various techniques of how you control. Gothelia uh, shallon, another introduction. David Douglas, Pacific Northwest. Um, fruits are very edible, then you can see where the birds spread it quite easily. I'm not sure if anybody's got experience of having to control that. Some West Coast gardens, the worst example I know of that is in North Northumberland, uh, Cragside National Trust property. They unfortunately have Ponticum, uh, Gulthiri Shallon, no, they've got four things, sorry. Ponticum, Gulthiri Shallon, Rubus Spectabilis, uh, Rubus Spectabilis and uh, Giant, uh, sorry, Himalay, uh, Japanese Knotweed, sorry. So they have four, so you could probably wish them luck in all control, but they, you do have to keep going with these things. And we've touched on some of the, the habitats, you know, when you trash or you allow a species to get in, once it's got its foothold, plants are incredibly, and particularly Simulane at Balsam, you've probably all seen the, the seed, you've maybe been unfortunate to get it pinged in your eyes as the, the seed capsule explodes, but you know, the, that seed can be flung quite considerable distances, so, so once you're in, this is, uh, I did it, this was just taken this, this year, the River Tay, anybody that knows Perth, I was out walking the, the dog along the bank and there it was. I'd never seen it there before, but obviously maybe the floods two years ago and again this year have just scoured away the river banks and given you that, that niche for the plant to get in. So if it was me in Perth, I'm not sure if there's anybody from Perth today, I would have been in there and started to pull. I did pull a few when I was waiting, but uh, I think it needs a, 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 perhaps a more strategic approach. Skunk cabbage. Uh, I'll not steal Emily's thunder because she's, I know she's going to, this is something that the Tweed Forum has been working on. But this is the infamous stand on West Loch Tarbert and Argyle. Um, and Argyle, I'll come back to Argyle in a minute. And I think we perhaps within the UK need to be aware of the impacts of these subtle changes in climate. You know, West Argyle 
you know, how much long, how much, or how long will it be before we have a similar climate in the other parts of the country? So, as well as looking overseas, we could perhaps be looking internally as well, both in Argyll and the Hebrides, Ireland. You know, where the, the temperatures have just risen that wee bit higher on average growing season, maybe a wee bit longer, and it gives you a good idea. But this is this is actually mentioned in several gardening books as a must see, but this is a very, very, very extensive. I'm not sure how many acres that'll be, and it's spreading as it all the time. Well, on a local level, on the on the this was uh, I was horrified at this. Uh, there have been one or two exchanges of emails between Food Forum and uh, Doy Botanic Garden, and I thought, well, I haven't been I've been away from Doy for a few years, so I thought I'd go down and have a look along the river, but I'd never expected to see that, and that's been within seven eight years that it's spread so extensively, almost on a tributary of the of the of the two. But I think. I think Emily is going to speak more about that later on, and there's written a pamphlet about that. But it's not the easiest plant to control. You know, chem chemical control in an aquatic environment is not something that uh, you need to. Well, you need to consider very carefully when you're going to do that. And then I think the, the I'm sorry, the wrong way. The mechanical control, i.e., digging, is uh, a good job for volunteers. I would suggest. But, uh, <laughs> you need to, you need to keep them well rewarded. Another potential problem, and this is something I think that's coming up on the outside, and we know it's a problem, but I've known it's a problem in South West Ireland, down in Cornwall, well, well particularly Cornwall. Um, this is the Gunner Manicata. Mm, I think the, whether it's Manicata or Tinctoria, you can probably speak all day about it, uh, from South America. It's again one of these species that's been around for a while. These inflorescences or the, the seed spikes, you know, there's a horrendous amount of seeds in there and if they're in the wrong place they can get going very quickly. And I just happened to be in a guile uh, en route to Ben Moore about, I think this was uh, July, and if, I don't know if you can pick the plant out, this is where uh, some land managers perhaps need a, you see it there? Yeah. This is the middle of nowhere, there's no human habitation anywhere around. And there's a lay-by uh, just above that. So you can see that. And I was actually looking at the, well, I'll come back. If you bear in mind the, the tree canopy at the top. So again, if, you've, if you're in the wrong place or the, at the wrong time and you have to have had a misspent youth looking at plants, then you can pick up these things quite quickly. But I think the key thing from, from our perspective is actually horizon scanning through kind of climate envelope mapping. Um, so we've got, coming over today, masses of this plant, Persicaria. You've probably seen it, and I think it's probably just almost at, almost at that uh, crutch point, whether it's just going to take off and be a, a nightmare of a problem. And this is another one that we have removed from the garden. This is Anatomia lessoniera. It might, you might have known it as Stipa rundinacea. But I would suggest there's perhaps three different climate envelopes that we're looking at. Atlantic, cool temperate, continental, i.e. warmer summers, cooler winters, and some species there, Mediterranean, uh, which, again, we might be fortunate in getting. Horizon scanning, I think there, there's lots of information out there, again on the web, but again it's a scientific collaboration within Europe and also across the, the world. Specifics, this is Nootka, anybody who's been up in the A9 will see the Nootka planted along the A9. I, have, I would have concerns about this. So again, networks, European network and Visif, there's lots of information there, but it's how we pick out that information and use that to the, the best advantage. And again, the pathways along roads and railway lines. This is in Iceland, which is probably not that dissimilar to some parts climatically. So that, that is a potential problem. Continental, if we start getting a problem with Ace and Magundo, that might be in the eastern parts. Again, we can do quite extensive climate map, envelope mapping and work out where that's a problem. But when you look at what problems that's creating in Poland, you know, in a floodplain there, you know, that's almost exclusively Ace and Magundo. Um, this is an interesting one. This is maybe going slightly further afield. This is using some of the uh, discussions I've had with some of our colleagues in North America, gardens. And the big problem that they've got is this climber, Akibia quinata. And again, it, you can probably see it. Just, it's a bit like ivy when it gets out of control. It just completely climbs up the trees and collapses them. Um, and because it's so shade tolerant, it just displaces every other species. And it even kills smaller. So that, that is a potential problem. I and mean, this is this, uh, you probably see it, it's quite interesting, I was looking at this, and there is a small, right in the northwest coast of this uh, 
uh, folk, hot and cold things, some people might know it. If anybody's been down to the Lizard Peninsula or just outside Dublin, you'll have seen it. It's a horrendous problem, and that is quite a... And I think that the issue there, when you remove, because it's so effective, when you remove it, I'm not sure what will come back in its place, whether it will be a, be a native plant. And it, it probably requires quite sensitive management and skills. But again, more information on, on the DAISY website. But I'll leave you with that. Another couple of this is my this is this is what keeps me awake at night, and for, as well as in days of non native, because unfortunately with the plants comes pests and diseases, um, and obviously whether we've got better at identifying them, whether we're well, I think we've got better at moving plants around, moving problems around. Um, global trade and plant climate change, early inception. You know, you've got old procession moth that we know came into trees in the London area, and is now spread, and it is a problem with human health. These hairs. Uh, cast off and create quite a respiratory problem and then I think the, the other thing we need to be aware of is the impacts on wider natural environment. This phytophthora that's affecting juniper or ostrich seedery, you know, I, th I think the, there needs to be a lot more work done on that as to how it's actually, how extensive that is and that work is ongoing. And then this weird thing here, this uh, Asian longhorn beetle that came in and packing cases in Kent and caused a, a massive uh, destruction of a big large white area. So this is Orsocidri uh, on Jupiter's communist, I think this is the, the upper Teasdale site and I, I think this is going to be a big challenge both in terms of the wider natural environment and also within cultivation as well. You know, how we're spreading these phytophthoras. Um, one of my colleagues uh, who's just a sergeant staff a year ago is a phytophthora expert and she is quite concerned about phytophthoras globally and it's the same, you'll notice there are similar phytophthoras or a trip affecting plants in South America, on the Ostracetus chilensis, and in New Zealand in the forest there as well. So that's a big, big issue. This is what really does keep me awake. But on a, a sort of a UK level, just up from the, the gunner picture that I showed you earlier, I noticed this patch in the forest. Anybody that's been over the rest of me thankful have probably seen the same patch. This is uh, large. You can see there's another patch up here. And there's something just going on in the colours here. So this is the I talked to the Remorum that's caused such massive impact in Glenfield. Anybody who's been there will know this, the scale of the, the plant removal that is required. You know, you can see it there. But nobody, I think, has, well, no, I, that's maybe unfair, but I think the, in my concern is what the impacts will be on the wider natural environment because originally the host range of this plant is horrendous um, in terms of the number of species it's sort of growing exponentially. I don't think there's any plant any woody plant that will be uh, immune from it or have a resistance to it. So that's really what does cause me the massive, uh, <coughs> cause me massive concerns. Plants, invasive non-native species plants, I think we can see them. What we can't see are some of these, these uh, pests and diseases. So we look to the future. What do we need to do? I think we need to be even more aware and responsible. I know that's quite a glib statement. It's quite easy to say. But we need to be aware of the potential impacts. I think some of the decisions that we make, we're maybe not fully aware of what our actions. It's a bit like the, uh, the press and marketing campaign with the, the pond dipping. Um, and sometimes you really do need a check and balance and you need somebody to interrogate what you do. And considering the debate, I, d I do think there is a wider debate about the appropriate design plant use within landscape planting. So I think that and this is not, you know, not just any landscape, if you like, this is the one outside the, the parliament. I think we need to have a massive public education exercise as to what we expect from our public spaces. Um, I know the difficulties that we've had in the past, you know, you can plant up uh, native plants and everybody will just come in, particularly of a certain generation, and say, where are the flowers? But I think that's part of our role to foster that discussion. But make sure, a bit like the bud layer, that we're using native species and we're not going to create another problem because there is a, a movement towards using non-native species in the wider landscape and I think that is, there is a potential for a problem but I'm a bit of a voice in the, the wilderness in that one. I think the big one is obviously the horizon scanning and acting probably at a slightly earlier stage to move plants from cultivation or trade if we know they're going to be a problem and I think the, the key thing is raise the awareness but do that responsibly. Um, you know obviously it's quite easy to, to, to castigate people but I do think we need to just slowly be aware of where we're going and what we're doing. And I know this is quite a cliche, but I think the, the future of the planet is in our hands. We do need to, to, to work responsibly and 
from a horticultural perspective, we do have a, a very serious message to get across to a wider audience. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.